Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jeremy Benamy. I'm the president and founder of J Street, and I am joined this afternoon here in Washington, D.C. by Dylan Williams, who is our vice president for government relations, and in New York by Rachel Lerner, who is our senior vice president for community relations. And I want to thank all of you for taking a few minutes out of your day to uh, chat with us about the current situation in Israel. As some of you know, we were planning to have a uh, video chat today between myself and Dylan to talk a little bit about the uh, debate tonight, the uh, Democratic presidential debate about the presidential uh, election and the potential agenda of presidential candidates uh, regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But we felt, in light of the events of recent days in the region, that it might make sense to have a slightly broader uh, conversation about our uh, reactions to the current situation, what can be done on a variety of different levels, not just the political and policy world. And so I've invited uh, Rachel to join us, and we certainly are looking forward to hearing from you uh, and hearing your questions and comments and concerns. The way to engage in the conversation is to email us at info, I-N-F-O, at jstreet.org, or uh, uh, tweet at us in our Twitter account with any questions or comments that you'd like us to share uh, with the group as a whole. Uh, so we're looking forward to hearing from you and to uh, engaging in a pretty open uh, and informal conversation. And Dylan and Rachel should feel free to chime in as well with any uh, thoughts and questions at any point uh, directed in my direction. Um, let me begin by saying uh, that J Street's been around for seven and a half years. And in the course of that time, we have lived through uh, three Gaza wars. Uh, we have experienced a number of different times in which there's been an explosion of uh, tension and violence, and innocent people on both sides have been left uh, victims in the wake. Um, it is simply one of the most uh, difficult things about working full-time on this issue uh, to consistently have to uh, see ourselves in the same uh, cycle of violence. And it is really important for me to say up front that everybody at J Street uh, is thinking about the people uh, in Israel uh, and the people who live in the occupied territory on the West Bank and in Gaza at a moment like this. Uh, the outcome, undoubtedly, of this round of violence will be more loss, uh, more tragedy, uh, more parents without children, more children without parents, uh, parents without children. Um, it is uh, simply devastating uh, for us on a, on a human level uh, to witness uh, yet another round of violence. And so I start by saying that J Street uh, expresses its sympathy uh, and uh, our uh, thoughts and prayers are with all of those on both sides of this conflict who are suffering and who are experiencing loss and who are feeling uh, afraid uh, in the middle of this devastation. So I start there. Um, and, you know, I quickly then move to what can one do? Because one doesn't simply want to uh, sit back and be uh, a passive receptor uh, at a moment like this of the terrible news that comes forward, but we're all activists. And the reason we joined J Street and the reason we got involved is because we want to try to, to do something and to ensure that this uh, reality show doesn't continue to rerun and rerun and rerun, and we get uh, a different outcome from all of this. So, uh, you know, really the, the first question that I think has to be on our mind as uh, Americans who are engaged in the political process and in the policy process, uh, what is it that we can be asking our leaders to do? I mean, there's a whole conversation that needs to happen about Palestinian society and Israeli society and where is the Palestinian leadership and where is the Israeli leadership that's really necessary. But we live here, uh, and this is an American organization. So to me, the, the first question, Dylan, um, and it does lead you know, directly into what we wanted to talk about, uh, is what can the United States do, and what is J Street urging the United States leaders do at a moment like this? Well, thanks, Jeremy. I think what's most clear about the situation we're in now is that as Americans who support Israel, uh, we face a very clear moment of choice. Uh, and that is a choice between pushing our government uh, in a more proactive direction uh, to engage in conflict, a conflict-ending agenda rather than just one that seeks to manage uh, crisis to crisis. 
that's one choice. Uh, the alternative to that choice is to passively sit back and allow the downward spiral to continue as the violence and suffering only increases and the prospects for a two-state solution only slip further away. So what we're urging the United States government to do is set forth a proactive conflict-ending agenda. And at a minimum, we see that having a couple of key elements. I think first and foremost is the need to address the real sense of despair and hopelessness, which is one of many elements feeding and fueling uh, the current crisis. And the best way the United States, as Israel's closest ally, can do that is to really make a bold step toward a two-state solution by working with our partners internationally to finally put forward a vision for ending this conflict. That vision, in whatever form it takes, would have a couple of key elements. First and most important, it would track the international consensus parameters for resolving the final status issues of this conflict. And these are the things that, as you said, Jeremy, many of us can recite in our sleep. Negotiated borders, which start on the 1967 lines with mutually agreed and negotiated swaps, and Palestinian capital in the Arab neighborhoods of East Jerusalem. Uh, right of return for Palestinians returning to the new state of Palestine, and not, except for a very narrow number of exceptions, the state of Israel. These are the elements that have become the international consensus positions. They track the 2000 Clinton parameters, which were personal to President Clinton at the very end of his presidency. But they were not put forward as official United States policy. We feel that the time has come for the United States to give hope to people in the region by actually issuing with its international partners a vision that tracks these parameters, but which are expressly United States policy. Uh, and what's key here is that these are not immutable rules to be imposed on the parties. This is main, merely and mainly a vision which the two parties could use as the basis for negotiations when conditions are right in the future, but which in the meantime, both the world and the populations themselves can hold their leaders accountable. So that's the first element of what we see as being a proactive agenda. Uh, secondly, the time has clearly come for the United States to push back on really harmful things that only exacerbate the conflict. And while there are a number of things that both parties have done which are unhelpful, and I'm, we're happy to discuss the, the terrible incidents of incitement that have uh, come up, including recently. What's really clear is that it's time for the United States to put meaning and really implement uh, its call uh, against settlement expansion. Um, you know, the United States has for a number of years now used a lot of creative adjectives to describe settlement expansion as unhelpful or not constructive. But what we've seen during all that time is that settlement expansion continues apace anyway, literally eating up the land on which the Palestinian state would have to be founded and further alienating and undermining uh, moderate Palestinians like President Abbas. Uh, we feel that the United States has to really start to implement its opposition to settlement expansion. And a place it could start is by moving from merely calling settlements uh, unhelpful to once again calling settlements illegal under international law. This has actually been the United States' unwavering policy uh, for a number of decades now, yet recent administrations don't uh, actually articulate it in those terms. They tend not to say that settlements are illegal. We think it sets an important marker and begins a conversation about what the actual concrete steps are to really push back against settlement expansion by calling them illegal at the official level. Finally, the third element that we really like to focus on today of what a proactive agenda looks like is to seriously get down to the hard work of addressing the human security concerns uh, in the region and promoting dialogue uh, in a way that hasn't happened before. You know, Looking first and foremost at the situation in the Gaza Strip, obviously a very dire situation, humanitarian situation, their lack of potable water 
incredible damage to infrastructure and homes. If there's any place to start on the human security front, it's certainly in the Gaza Strip, and making sure that the United States and all international partners are actually delivering on commitments to help rebuild and make that area somewhat more livable for the people who reside there. Relatedly, some of the water issues which touch upon Gaza most intensely also have regional impl implications. There's obviously water access issues in the West Bank, and there are water quality and environmental issues which touch upon each of the Palestinian territory, Israel, and Jordan all together, and can be addressed in a very constructive regional way. What this entails, as well as other aspects of improving the quality of life and the human security of people on the ground, is promoting investment, promoting investment not just in underserved areas of Israel, but promoting investment uh, in the Palestinian territory as well. And this is really a key feature of some of the work that businesses, both Israeli and Palestinian, are doing and working together on right now, even as the security situation deteriorates, to really promote the underpinnings which will one day, we hope, lead to a, or help lead to a two-state solution. And finally, under human security and the need for greater investment, giving people a real stake in the future uh, of the region and hopefully a two-state solution, is uh, the need to assure, ensure that if an agreement is reached, that the funding exists to actually help these two peoples build the kind of societies they need that are capable of living with each other in peace. And that's where the idea that has been around for a number of years now of starting an international fund to help implement a comprehensive agreement along the lines of the Northern Ireland model comes from. And we think it's time for the United States to work with its international partners to also to uh, begin to authorize and actually put forward commitment amounts for funding this international fund, this pot of money which is essentially there to help with dialogue, civil society, and additional infrastructure projects that all the peoples uh, in the region work on, uh, would work on together pursuant to a comprehensive agreement. And that is another element of the human security package that J Street will be pushing for. So, so thanks for the outline, Dylan. And, I, and we thought it was important at the beginning of the call to just lay out for people what we're trying to push in the you know, Washington policy world uh, as what the United States government can do. Um, I, I do want to turn to to Rachel to talk a little bit more about the Jewish community uh, and the organized Jewish community's response. And I just want to remind folks that if you would like to ask a question of uh, J Street, of me, of Dylan, of Rachel, uh, please email us at info at jstreet.org and we'll be getting the questions fed into the conversation. And also feel free to tweet at us and our, our handles at jstreet.org and everything's spelled out, including the dot, D-O-T-O-R-G. Um, Rachel, Dylan's just outlined, you know, what essentially, uh, amounts to a very, uh, you know, wonky uh, policy agenda, right? I mean, from a D.C. perspective, 5,000 miles from the violence, it's very easy for us to sit here in our office and talk about, you know, parameters of a conflict-ending resolution and economic investment and, and all the rest of it. Um, but in a moment like this, what tends to happen inside the American Jewish community is much more emotional uh, response, which is completely understandable, and obviously it's very emotional on the ground where people are living in fear and dealing with loss and, and desperation. And the question for J Street, I think, at moments like this is always, how do we try to inject into the American Jewish conversation uh, and into the pro-Israel conversation the need to at least think about some of the things along the lines of what Dylan has just outlined, which are more longer-term solutions to the underlying problems when the emotional reaction is really to hunker down and, and react to the immediate violence. And you've worked in pro-Israel advocacy now for a couple of decades, uh, and, well, approaching a couple of decades. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'd love to get your take, and, and if you could share maybe with some of our leaders and activists what it is that we can try to do in our communities as federations and uh, Jewish Community Relations Councils and others begin to have community forums and reactions to these events, how can we try to interject some sense of, of solution and longer-term vision into a more immediate and emotional conflict? Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, thank you all of you who are, who are uh, joined us. Um, 
thank you for aging me. Um, <laughs> I don't think I've worked in the Jewish community for decades, but um, but I'm I'm getting close to that. Uh, you know, I think that this is a um, this is a very sensitive uh, issue and and not an easy issue sometimes for for us to find our footing. I mean, first I just want to say that I think that the that the the emotional response is something that you know many of us have friends and family who are in Israel right now. Um, we may have colleagues who also uh, live in the Palestinian territory, and this is you know if 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 your Facebook looks like mine, um, you're hearing from your friends and family who live in the region at this moment, um, who are trying to trying to keep their kids safe. Uh, trying to game out how they get from point A to point B um, with without putting themselves or their families in danger, and I, I think that this first, I think that this emotion is really very much shared by um, by all of us. And um, but the the reaction of the American Jewish community um, or the organized Jewish community is often one of defense because really that that is where. Israel advocacy organizations are oriented. Um, you know, their focus is always is always on simply defending Israel from the the battle of the moment and the conflict of the moment. Um, and it is unfortunately not. Um, it's very reactive, but it's it's often not proactive. And thinking through what what are the solutions. Um, and what are the things that we can do as a community, as Americans and as Jews, to to make sure that not only that the violence has ended, you know, can end at this moment, or not only that we're standing with with our brothers and sisters in Israel in this moment, but that this doesn't happen a year from now. And and you know, this question about what what does it mean to to stand in solidarity with you know with with the Jewish people and with the people of the region in this moment, I think is um, there, there is a solution that the organized Jewish community provides, which you know, which sort of points to rallies and statements in this um, in this moment. I think where where we come at it, um, and where where organizations like ours come at it often is is to think about you know what what do, what do Israeli and Palestinians deserve? What is the future that they deserve? What is the life that they deserve? And how do we ensure that you know that, that this this violence does not happen again. That not only can we end this for the moment, but that we can end it forever. And that all points to the root causes um, and and the and the underlying and exacerbating issues. And and I think that it's important that I think that it's, it's important that American the American Jewish community first that first that we decide what we want to say in this moment, which I which I know sort of organizationally. And um, sort of as you're, you know, those of you in, the, in in communities, you know, thinking about what what are the things that you want to say in this moment? What are the things that you think that Israel needs and the Palestinian people need in order to have a better future? Um, we need to create that space for ourselves and for our leadership um, and for for our constituencies. But also, I think we need to be able to engage the organized Jewish community in a moment like this. Um, in and extend our, our hand in community, you know, not adversarially, but in a way that says to them, you know, you you want this violence to end, we want this violence to end. What are we going to do together in this moment to make sure that this is not happening a year from now? Um, I think that that's I think that that is important. Um, I think it's important that we think about who you know our our communal leadership, um, the, our who are who are the rabbis who are affiliated with with our movement. Um, to engage them in this moment and think about, you know, how do we how do we um, engage the Jewish community? How do we have a conversation with the Jewish community to make sure that things like this don't happen um, every every few months? So, I warned you that I was going to ask you about uh, the World Zionist Congress that you are an elected delegate to. And for those of the people who are joining us who don't know the history. Uh, the World Zionist Congress is actually the body that was brought together in the very, very end of the 19th century by Theodore Herzl that essentially gave birth to uh, the State of Israel. And it, it is a representative body of Jews all over the world, and its mission has been 
to initially uh, create uh, and since then to help you know sustain and build uh, a homeland, a national state for uh, the Jewish people. Uh, and every few years, I think it's been about four or five years since the last uh, Congress, there's a gathering of delegates from all over the world that are essentially like the uh, the Congress, you know, of the uh, Jewish people, uh, who are charged with uh, overseeing that work uh, and where it stands. And here we are in the year 2015. Uh, we're well over, you know, 100 years now. It's almost 120 years since the first World Zionist Congress. And I am really curious, sort of putting this into the perspective, into the historical perspective of where we're at. This ongoing conflict uh, today that is rearing its ugly head yet again, it sort of continues this pattern and, uh, you know, uh, competition between the Jewish people and the Palestinian people that was there on the very first day uh, that this all began with the first Zionist Congress. And it, it feels to me that the people gathering next week, the hundreds of delegates from all over the world that are gathering, it, it would be hard to gather and not take stock of where we're at uh, in that process and how the work just isn't done yet. Uh, do you think that in that space that there will be uh, an ability for people to recognize that the future of that whole enterprise of creating a state for the Jewish people hinges on finding some way to ultimately resolve this conflict, that this is just simply not a sustainable status quo? Is there, is there a space for that in this broader communal dialogue, do you think? Well, I think so, and I think that um, the, certainly the, the slate that I'm, that I'm going with, the Hatik the slate, which is the progressive Zionist slate, is, is going to help create that space. Um, you know, the World Zionist Congress is an opportunity for American Jews and Jews from all over the world to have a conversation with, with Israelis, with Israeli leadership, about what kind of Israel, uh, what kind of Israel we're building together, and what are our aspirations for Israel? What are our values? And it's very much you know, the 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 ethos of that Congress is this sense that 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 the state of Israel is a project of the Jewish people, of all of the Jewish people. So so it it invites that kind of conversation. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going, and uh, Benji Cannon, who is a former J Street U president and is also on J Street staff now, um, we're both going to be part of the Hatikva slate, which is the progressive Zionist uh, progressive Zionist slate, and we're going to be introducing a number of resolutions and conversations to that Congress. But one of them is on the issue of transparency. Um, the World Zionist Congress sort of presides over and controls three enormous uh, Israeli uh, institutions and organizations, um, the World Zionist Organization, the Jewish Agency for Israel, and the Karen Kayemet, the Israel, the Jewish National Fund. And those, those organizations um, oversee Jewish education, social services, urban renewal, and rural settlements in uh, in Israel, and one of the we know that, for instance, the World Zionist uh, Organization Settlement Division uh, gives hundreds of millions of dollars from the government to to help fund the settlement enterprise over the over the Green Line. What we don't know is how much money their what their budget is and how much money they actually spend over the Green Line, and that's because there's no transparency um, in their in their reporting or in their oversight. And so we are going to be asking that all of the agencies that are administered by the, the Congress, the WZO, the Jewish Agency, and the JNF be transparent. Because our concern is that, again, hundreds of millions of dollars is, is going over the green line. Some of that money comes from, you know, comes from American, uh, American donations that funnel through organizations in, in the U.S. Um, you know, this is, it is our responsibility to make sure that, that these organi organizations are transparent about where they spend their money so that we can have that honest conversation with, with leadership in Israel about what kind of Israel we want to build uh, for, for our future, you know, understanding the danger 
that, um, that the settlement enterprise, settlements that are built over the Green Line pose to a two-state solution and to any prospects for peace in the region. So one way in which J Street members and J Street activists can be very engaged in trying to help solve these issues and try to push towards a solution is through advocacy within the Jewish community about how money is spent and asking for this kind of transparency either from the uh, umbrella organizations that have a national and international role or in our own communities and asking for what is the funding policy of individual communal foundations and federations and that's one aspect. The other advocacy avenue of course is back into the political realm and I have a couple of questions here. Uh, Suzanne Shirney asks whether or not you see any of the 2016 presidential Democratic candidates taking the types of stances that we are outlining here uh, against Republican candidates. I mean, or perhaps would there be a Republican candidate even who might consider stances like these? Will this type of issue be an issue at all in the 2016 general election? And I would just add to Suzanne's question, in 1998, the first lady of the United States, Hillary Clinton, was the very first major public official to call for the creation of a Palestinian state. Uh, in 2009, uh, when Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State, uh, she is purported to or reported to have had a very uh, tough phone call uh, with the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, Netanyahu, about the need to stop the settlements uh, and that you know no settlement growth means absolutely no settlement growth uh, over the Green Line. Um, another question that came through is, are these the kinds of positions that we can expect Hillary Clinton to continue to articulate uh, tonight in the debate or going forward in the, uh, in the course of the campaign? So let me answer this way, and I think there are really two kind of uh, levels you want to analyze this question at. The first is uh, within the Democratic candidates themselves. I think you will see, if it's not clearly expressed in this debate, at least in discussions going forward and debates going forward, that uh, each of the Democratic, major Democratic candidates do support the concept of a two-state solution and would not seek to change that as United States policy. So that's the good news. The question as to whether any of them is willing to go a bit further and actually set forward some of the vision that I articulated uh, or uh, perhaps turn up the heat in terms of how they talk about settlements, uh, for example. I think that remains to be seen. Looking at the Republican uh, side of the presidential primaries, and I say this as a former Republican staffer myself, I think the more relevant question there is how many of these candidates actually support the two-state solution at all. Uh, a number of them have given us a uh, real concern as to whether or not they can would, as president, continue what has been a bipartisan consensus across administrations uh, from both parties uh, in support of the two-state solution and against moves which undermine the prospects for it, including settlement expansion. I think you're seeing a real lurch. I don't even think rightward is the right concept here or the right direction, but you're seeing a real lurch away from a two-state solution on behalf of some of these candidates, and I do expect uh, issues related to the U.S.-Israel relationship to play a role when it comes to the general election, uh, for sure, given how much uh, right-wing rhetoric has been leveled against President Obama and Secretary Clinton as Secretary of State for pursuing policies which were no different and in some cases milder than previous policies and actions by uh, uh, previous presidents, including Republican presidents. So there's a couple of questions that have come in uh, I, that, that I would say lead to uh, what happens if the U.S. doesn't do anything. You know, are there other options out there besides U.S. governmental action? Uh, and Eli Kalir writes, uh, is it time to move to the Security Council? Uh, is, is it time for us to uh, use our influence as J Street to urge that the United States not veto uh, a resolution at the UN. Might it be a resolution that uh, criticizes Israeli settlements? Might it be a UN Security Council resolution along the lines of uh, laying out parameters? Can you just talk a little bit about what J Street's doing on that front and what our view is of the likelihood of 
movement on any of those types of resolutions. Absolutely. I think the one of the key features of the United States putting forward a vision that tracks the international consensus parameters is that it cannot do so alone. Any step it takes in that regard has to be done in concert with or at least with the very strong public and quick support of uh, the key players in the international community. Toward that end, if there were a United Nations Security Council resolution uh, that appropriately tracked the international consensus position and served as a guidepost, not an imposition uh, uh, in terms of setting out the international community's vision or resolution of these final status issues, that is not only something we would support, but we've actually called on the United States government to proactively work with others on the United Nations Security Council, including the government of France, to actually craft something that is fair and just and actually moves the ball forward. Also on the international front, I don't think the United States or the United Nations Security Council is the only game in town. There are other international fora out there. We've even heard Israeli former officials who support the two-state solution raise the idea of having the P5 plus one take a look at this issue and see if they can move forward with some sort of statement or other set of parameters. And that's the group that just negotiated the that, Iran. That's the group that just successfully negotiated the Iran nuclear agreement. So, back to you, Rachel. One of the uh, uh, lines of questions that I'm getting, and again, I just want to remind people, if you have a question that you'd like us to address, please do email us at info at jstreet.org or, or uh, tweet at us with your questions or comments. Um, there's a, a question in a couple of different places about Israel and Israeli public opinion in a time like this. And we saw yesterday or Sunday, I think, the opening session of the Knesset, and we heard a very strong speech, I thought, from the opposition leader, uh, Bougie Herzog, who said, uh, you know, you claim to be a uh, prime minister who's brought us security, and look where you've gotten us. And, uh, you know, it was a very strong articulation of a opposition message uh, saying that the path that Israel is on, that has been carved and led by uh, Netanyahu and the, and the right politically in Israel, is leading us not only uh, towards one state, but towards insecurity, yet, yet they claim to be furthering security. And we know that a majority of Israelis do still support a two-state solution, and they don't necessarily either like the prime minister, support his policies, or believe that Israel's on the right track. And you've spent a lot of time in Israel. As you said, you have a lot of friends and family and cousins and others who are there, and you're in touch with Israeli public opinion. Do you have any thoughts, and this is the, you know, the question from, from Tony Lucente, um, why can't the Israeli public manage to harness uh, the disagreement with Netanyahu over these issues into the possibility of real political change that actually changes the course? I mean, what is your opinion, and, and what have we gathered as J Street over these years about uh, why that just doesn't happen? Well... A lot of the research around public opinion, you know, you know, states that Israelis and Palestinians both want to change. They both they both support a two-state solution, but um, they they have no faith that the other side is um, is amenable or or like-minded. And I think that that causes a tremendous amount of amount of despair. You know, and and hopelessness that that I think leaves people leaves people stagnant um, when there's no sense that you know that that things could get better because there's there's no partner on the other side. Then then it's very difficult I think to move um, to move politically or to you know or to to even see a a reason for changing course if if you know if your sense is that, that the changing course isn't gonna isn't gonna make a difference. So I, I think it's very important that that you know we're we're able to to work with organizations that that raise up the voices on both sides that 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 want a two state solution, that that want you know want a diplomatic solution to to, to this conflict and that are working with you know, working together with Israelis and Palestinians um, to try to build a better a better future for themselves, the ability to raise those voices um, and to give that kind of um, 
that kind of perspective I think is important. And then I think that as Americans that we also have a unique perspective that we that we should be able to convey, we need to convey to Israelis and Palestinians about um, you know, when what being removed from the, the conflict, I think, you know, certainly we've we've heard that that uh, you know this sense of, of how can we speak if we're not there, and 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 I, I understand that sentiment, but we also have I think a, a unique perspective when we're not under siege and we're not um, in the violence every day to to sort of see it on the, the conflict on a different level and to be able to to speak to Israelis and Palestinians about the fact that that the the status quo isn't isn't sustainable and that you know, the, the current leadership is, is getting them and the current sort of their current actions and policies are getting them nowhere and that something needs to change. Right. I think that sense of uh, despair uh, is certainly present on the Israeli side and has undercut the support for the kinds of policies that Herzog and others are articulating. I think I've heard a lot of analyses over the last couple of weeks that that sense of despair and hopelessness has been a lot of the fuel of the anger on the Palestinian side because we've been seeing that a lot of the attacks have been by teenagers, even young teenagers. I think yesterday there was a 13-year-old who attacked another 13-year-old in a terrible incident in the north of Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, these are kids who didn't even experience the first intifada or the second intifada. Um, but the other thing that they don't have is they don't have any real exposure to Israelis and Jews as human beings, because there's been such a cutoff over the last 15 years between the two societies that an entire generation is arising that on the one side, uh, you know, the Palestinians only know Israelis as fully armored uh, soldiers at checkpoints, uh, and Israelis only know Palestinians as potential terrorists who might blow up uh, themselves at a, at a checkpoint or on a bus. And in that environment, uh, there really is no way to build that understanding at a people-to-people -people level of what, uh, you know, is on the other side and that there is a human being who cares about their family and actually wants to build a better future. And I think that sometimes, you know, the outside perspective uh, can be of help. And I think it's a really important role for J Street to be a partner and a, and a voice of support for those on both sides of the conflict who are trying to build that, that future. Um, Dylan, not to let us get too carried away on the people to people stuff and the emotional and back to politics and policy, uh, Yonatan Shapir in Rochester uh, writes in, he wants to go a little bit more deeply into what it is exactly that we would recommend on the issue of settlements. I mean, how, other than starting to call the settlements illegal, what is the sort of action that, uh, you know, we would urge the United States government to take in order to actually give meaning uh, to that uh, policy that we've had now for quite a few decades. Right. So what's important to remember here is that shortly after the breakdown in uh, the Kerry Initiative, uh, the United States began its own internal review of its uh, policies towards the settlement, not the overarching policy of whether or not it will oppose or continue to oppose settlements. That's obviously the case, but a review of what are the steps that it could take as the United States government to further enforce uh, this United States opposition. And there is a whole menu and range of steps that the United States government could take. Now, I hesitate to go into any detail about any type or particular policy, lest people think that that is something that we are encouraging the United States government to take, and I think the first and most important step is for the United States government to actually conclude this review and come forward with some new ideas. So that is beyond simply calling the settlements uh, illegal again, uh, actually coming forward with its own menu of proactive steps to take is something that we have asked the United States government to do uh, and will continue to ask them to actually conclude and report on. Uh, before the end of this administration and hopefully much sooner. But within that scope of things, there are a lot of things which tie very nicely back into the notion of transparency that Rachel raised and how important it is in our community. It's also important at the macro level in terms with of our tax dollars. with our tax dollars. Uh, there have been a number of reports over the years now and, and thankfully a few more more recently indicating that uh, donations coming from Americans to uh, charities 
here in the United States and ultimately charities in Israel that go to fund settlement expansion activities, uh, a lot of those, if not all of those, uh, donations enjoy tax-deductible status. Uh, at a minimum, we need to know the amount, and the United States government needs to report on and have its own understanding of the amount of tax relief in American uh, dollars, essentially, that are going to support uh, an enterprise that the United States is against. And it is against it because it undermines Israeli security and U.S. interests as well. So encouraging the United States government to actually take real steps on that front, on transparency, I think is another uh, uh, step that is in the realm of good first steps. Um, Rachel, sort of coming back to the, the communal conversation, uh, we got a question via Twitter about the tensions in our community, right? There, there is an escalating, and I guess particularly online in social media, the level of rhetoric and the, and the vitriol uh, just continues to go up and up in, in a fever pitch almost, and sometimes it's directed outward and you know, it can be anti-Arab or anti-Palestinian, and Palestinian can be anti-Semitic and anti-Israel, of course. But within our own community, uh, there's also an escalation of the rhetoric, sometimes towards us, uh, sometimes towards other groups that are uh, trying to express opinions that may not be in line with the government of Israel and with some of the, the more established, organized uh, community. Um, what can be done within our own community uh, to try to de-escalate some of the tension. You know, we've, we've talked about J Street wanting to do its part to bridge some of these divides and to heal some of these rifts. What, what's your advice for people in communities who want to try to help to de-escalate the tension uh, within our own community? I think the most important thing is building relationships. Um, you know, building building relationships with, with community leadership, uh, Building relationships with with your you know sort of your 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 local and maybe even some of your most vocal um, activists in a in a in a community is is very important and and to be honest you know often that has to be done when when tensions are not very high that has to be done sort of in the day in and day out of our work I think you know when 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 we're able to, to build those relationships, when folks, when we can understand where, where someone is coming from who might not agree with us, when they understand where we're coming from, when they, we can put, they can put a human face on us and we on them, I think that that help, does help, um, it, it helps tamp down the, you know, some of the rhetoric, but I also think it gives us the opportunity to, 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 to say, you know, to say what, what we think and what, what we feel in, you know, in the moment and, you know, sort of as as these issues as these issues progress, I you know I don't think we should be I don't think we should be quiet about about sort of what our our sensibilities are and and where we're at and and what we think the solutions are. But I do think that it starts with um, again with building those relationships, and that does not happen online. I mean, I have to be also be honest that that does not happen in a Facebook fight or in a Twitter war. Um, you know that that happens with just proactive in person. Relationship building. I think that that is how we will help build out um, build out this movement, and that's how we will move people. I do think it's very interesting. This isn't necessarily a question. This is just a comment. Uh, the role of social media in uh, conflicts today uh, makes everything so much different than it was ten or twenty years ago. Uh, we were just hearing from our Israel director. Uh, in a meeting just before this conference call, that essentially every single incident that is taking place right now is being captured on video. Uh, and then those videos are immediately being shared and going viral. And so people's phones are just filling immediately with the instantaneous imagery of exactly what's going on, which is, I think, upping the level of immediate tension and fear and anger in a way that when you just would wait for the hourly news, you know, I think about when I lived in Israel uh, and there would be explosions, uh, you know, and you would wait until the top of the hour and you'd get the chimes of the news and then you'd hear what was going on and there was at least a little bit of time and distance and processing and 
uh, the way in which you got it was mediated by somebody reporting. And, you know, it's a similar thing with the tensions within our own community, that this ability to be able to just tweet and, and post your immediate anger and thoughts at somebody else, but not have to really do it to their face because you're just sort of doing it anonymously online, I think it just ups the uh, level of, of vitriol and emotion. And so what you're saying, I think, is really important, which is that you have to get away from that and develop real, you know, people-to-people -people and human relationships at all levels uh, around this. I think that's really important. Um, so shifting back again to the conversation around uh, uh, what we can do, uh, we've been discussing the fact that in a few weeks we're going to be marking the 20th anniversary of the killing of, of Yitzhak Rabin. Um, one thing that's so important about Rabin is, is to remember uh, how he talked about the need to pursue peace even as you, you know, never stop fighting terror, uh, and, you know, never stop fighting terror, of course, while you're pursuing peace. And, you know, the, the question of what is his legacy, uh, and how do we take the lessons of what he tried to teach as a former, uh, you know, chief of staff of the army and a prime minister and defense minister, and, you know, no one could question his defense and security credentials. Um, you know, is there something that we can be urging our activists to be doing Maybe this is more to Rachel than uh, than Dylan, but as we begin to see that anniversary coming up, um, you know, are there things that could be going on in people's communities to use that as a teachable moment? And you know, what what are some of your initial thoughts about that? And what could we encourage J Street activists to begin to to do, knowing that anniversary is coming up? I, I mean, I I think that I think that that anniversary resonates with resonates with almost everybody in the. Um, in the Jewish community, and I think it's a it's a very meaningful time. So it's a very good idea to be thinking about um, about who our potential community partners might be, and who who our who our allies are, and also who we want to be able to engage and think about ways that we might um, come together at community gatherings, um, that we might join together to do some sort of meaningful action. Um, in commemoration. I think there's a lot of creative things that we can do, and I know that it's something that we're thinking about sort of out of, uh, out of J Street National as well. Right, and you know, I think also looking for events that are happening in your community already. I think that there are going to be a number of uh, memorial uh, events, and there'll be events at synagogues and other places, and so trying to plug into pre-existing events and talking to the rabbis or the professionals that are putting them together about Things that could potentially be added to the program uh, is something that you know, I think back on existing events. Yeah, I think that's very important as well. So we've got about ten minutes left, maybe a little bit less actually. Um, if anybody has any final questions or comments, please you know continue to email them in. We'll also continue to respond to questions after this is all over. Um, I've got a few more questions that have come in, and what I'll really do is just frame them all and then just ask. Uh, Dylan and then Rachel for any final thoughts for people because I think that as we leave a call like this the question isn't so much just the analysis of what's going on it is what can we do from here and you know the questions come in what can J Street do to promote its principles to JCRCs and federations and the conference of presidents how can we help uh, lead towards long-term solutions on the policy front how can we make sure that our policy prescriptions are part of the the Democratic debate, how can we influence the Democratic presidential primary, asks David Al Alpert in the views uh, of these candidates. So what are your final thoughts about what people who are watching, what our activists can be doing on the political and, and policy advocacy front, and what are your final thoughts, Rachel, on what, what can be done on the communal front? Maybe I'll start with, uh, with Dylan. Sure, absolutely. The, the number one thing that all of us can do as pro-Israel, pro-peace activists is be in regular touch with our members of Congress. And uh, that can mean uh, calling them regularly when we alert you to a specific piece of legislation or a policy matter that is moving through Congress that we would like you to weigh in on. Uh, it can also be uh, working with the J Street staff in your region to uh, ensure that you are, uh, your voice is being heard in our regular meetings with members of Congress, whether they're here in Washington, D.C., or in uh, your local communities in their states and districts. The reason that congressional contact is so important is 
that members of Congress have so many things on their plate. 600,000 constituents, the whole world of problems is literally at their doorstep every minute of the day. And so they tend to compartmentalize and try and make it as easy as possible to get the information they need on an issue. And if they are only hearing from one small portion of our community, like they had in all the decades before J Street came about, they're going to see that as the one and only way to faithfully represent the views of pro-Israel Americans when we know that the majority of American Jews and other friends of Israel actually take a very different view when it comes to some of these most essential questions on how the U.S. and its international partners can move forward with a two-state solution. So congressional contact is absolutely the key. Please be in touch with us or the regional staff of J Street in your region to learn more about how you can be involved in that. And one of the things I would say, Dylan, that was so fascinating about the Iran fight uh, is that I do think that there's a lot more openness now in Congress to hearing from us. Absolutely. Uh, you know, that we not only helped to pass a landmark achievement of, you know, international diplomacy and of, of nuclear nonproliferation, uh, but I think that there's a, a change in the perception on Capitol Hill about who speaks on some of these issues for the Jewish community, and that creates an opening Absolutely. that we should use when it comes to these issues. And I think that was one of the reasons that we always said we were involved in the Iran fight, was because we wanted to change the political dynamics on Capitol Hill. And so I think you've seen, and I've certainly seen, uh, that there is a desire, uh, an active you know, request almost from members of Congress to be hearing from us. They don't feel like they hear from us enough. They see our polling data, uh, that we represent a majority of the community, but they're asking you, and we're asking you, uh, to plug in and be involved in the advocacy uh, work. So that's when it comes to policy and trying to shift what presidential candidates are saying and what members of Congress are saying. Any final thoughts, uh, Rachel, from the community perspective and what, what people who are watching this can be doing? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a number of things that, that folks can do in terms of the Jewish community. One, again, is is think about, think about the, the leadership in the Jewish community that you know um, your your rabbi, if you have one, if you're affiliated with the synagogue, you know this, your synagogue leadership. If you have relationships with, you know, with with the Jewish larger Jewish institutions in your community, your federation, your Jewish community relations council. Um, if you know those people, then then reach out to them and and engage them and t tell them about who you are and why you believe what you believe. I think it's important that they know. Um, that, that they know that, 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 that these issues, that, that two states, that pro-Israel, pro-peace is important to you. Um, the other thing is that we have some really good tools to help you, you know, reach out and to, to use in, in, uh, in Jewish spaces. One of them is uh, we have, I see that right behind Dylan is a map um, of Israel with a green line. Um, J Street has, um, has produced maps of Israel with a green line um, because Sadly, um, in, in most of our Jewish institutions, um, when we talk about Israel, when we teach about Israel, um, we use a map that, that does not show um, a future of Israel that is, that is sustainable, that is peaceful, um, that is democratic. So um, it's, you know, this is a really wonderful engagement tool for you to bring to your synagogue, your JCC, again, your, you know, any other Jewish institute, your, your, you know, your kids' day schools, summer camps. Um, for you to use and as a way to start a conversation about the importance of building building an Israel that is um, that is that is Jewish and 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 democratic. So that's I think one one way that that a very sort of easy conversation starter and a good way to for um, for organizations and for institutions to demonstrate their support for pro Israel pro peace positions. Um, I think also um, some of you may know that that J Street U is leading leading the way on transparency. That they've been engaging Jewish federations in in some key cities and asking them to be transparent about their policies on how they fund um, how they fund inside and outside of the of the Green Line. Um, this is something that that is you know, is developing and is pretty exciting and they're building relationships every day with Jewish community leadership and if you want to know more about that, then you should please be in contact with um, either J Street professional staff in, in your region 
or um, if you if you're in a community with a chapter or with your J Street chapter leadership to learn a little bit to learn a little bit more. And I think you'll be hearing a lot more about the Green Line uh, over the coming weeks and months. Uh, it's a real focus of J Street's work uh, over the coming year. Um, it has enormous uh, implications, of course, for what Dylan was discussing and the question of whether or not the settlement project over that Green Line is, in fact, illegal and what the United States is going to do about it. It has tremendous importance for our communities and where we uh, do send our charitable money and how we uh, uh, vis visibly display uh, the Israel, the state of Israel that we do, in fact, support. Uh, and it is a, a really important organizing principle, I think, for a lot of our thinking about personal, communal, and governmental action that can help to build a two-state solution. So you'll be hearing a lot more about the green line from us in the months ahead. Um, we're at the end of this uh, conversation. I want to say, first of all, to all of you who joined us, uh, there were several hundred people on this call, and I know more will watch the uh, tape, and I really appreciate your taking the time uh, at this difficult moment uh, to engage in this conversation. We hope that everybody will come out of this with some actions and, and activities uh, to take and, and to work with us at J Street. Please spread the word, uh, you know, invite people to join. Uh, J Street by signing up for our emails and joining us on our Facebook page uh, and really do uh, get involved in the work of J Street in your communities because this kind of advocacy, whether it's political or it's communal, uh, is only going to work if we get people involved in their communities and make their voices heard. Uh, I'll just end with a final uh, comment again of J Street's uh, deep, deep sympathy for all of those who have suffered over the course of the past few weeks in this uh, latest round of violence. Uh, it is our hope that the leadership on the Palestinian side, the leadership on the Israeli side, will step up and step forward and help to uh, lead to their communities ending uh, this cycle of violence and taking steps that move in the right direction. And we are here uh, to be partners in the search for peace, for security, uh, and for a two-state solution. So again, thank you to Rachel Lerner in New York, uh, to Dylan Williams uh, here with me in Washington, and to all of you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Take care.